think we've had another 20 people join us. So I'm sure we'll have many more, but welcome everyone uh, to another wonderful Nephrology Grand Rounds, uh, virtual this time. We are going to be joined uh, by Ashley Jefferson, as well as PATH Conference with um, Dr. Najafian and Dr. Huang. Uh, unfortunately, Kate Butler is um, off doing work-related um, tasks, and so I'm covering for her just for today. Uh, so I'm going to start by handing it off to Ashley Jefferson, who will be discussing IgA nephropathy. Okay, morning it's everyone. Great. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm gonna talk about IGA nephropathy this morning. Um, there's been a lot of movement in this area over the last few years. So I thought it's a, a good time for an update. Uh, I do have a disclosure. Uh, both Abal and I are local PIs on the applause study um, from Novartis. So I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Okay, so I'm gonna kick straight into uh, the elephant in the room. Uh, are steroids indicated in IgA nephropathy? Um, so this is uh, quite a cool picture which I was able to generate. So a lot of discussion about uh, artificial intelligence and uh, chat GPT writing essays and writing papers for us. It's only a matter of time until we're not needed. Uh, but there's also uh, an image making machine or an art making, making uh, AI bot called DAL-E or DALI. Uh, so I just asked it to draw an elephant in the room, give it some instructions, and it came out with this nice piece of artwork. So uh, it's uh, it's interesting what we can do with, with AI in just a, a sort of social way at the moment. So steroids are the indicated two major studies that I just wanted to review very quickly, the STOP IGA study and the testing trial that was published last year. So STOP IGA, as all aware, is 2015. 162 patients randomized to intensive supportive therapy or supportive therapy plus immunosuppression. And the bottom line is that this was a negative study. And even after 10 years follow-up, there was no difference uh, in, in between the two groups. I want to highlight a very important thing about this study though, uh, and that's the rate of decline in the placebo group. Uh, we can see in the placebo group, the EGFR decline was minus 1.6 mils per minute per year. And this is actually much less than the control groups in almost all studies. And if you think about it, these are 40-year-old uh, patients, subjects, who we might expect to lose about one mil per minute per year just with aging. So the placebo group had a very, very slow decline. So it was actually hard to show any difference uh, in this group. And then testing came out. So testing uh, came out, uh, the final publication came out in 2022. This was a multi-center study of 503 patients with proteinuria greater than one gram per day. The mean follow-up uh, came out to 4.2 years. And the primary endpoint was a 40% decline in EGFR, end-stage adrenal disease or death. It was a six month uh, intervention of oral methylprednisone versus placebo. Um, and there were actually, this is actually two studies together in some ways, because the first uh, uh, full dose uh, of methylprednisone, which started off at roughly 60 milligrams a day of prednisone, and then tapered by roughly 10 milligrams per day, um, was actually stopped early. Uh, it was stopped after about 17 months because of excess serious adverse events in the steroid group. So many infections and actually four deaths in this group, several, uh, at least a couple from uh, pneumocystis pneumonia. So the trial was then halted for a while and restarted at the reduced dose. And the reduced dose was somewhere around 40 milligrams of prednisone a day and a taper. And this time Bactrim was added for PJP prophylaxis. And the summary of all these patients show that there was a difference between the two groups. So at 4.2 years, about 30% of the methylprednisone group had reached the primary endpoint compared to 43%. And if we look at a couple of graphs from the study, if we look at this graph, first of all, this is the proteinuria graph. We can see that early on, um, oops, early on there was actually a pretty fast drop in the proteinuria. But over time, um, after the steroids were stopped, this the difference uh, declined. And by three years, there was no difference in proteinuria. And similarly, if we look at the uh, primary endpoint, we can see separation early on, um, but afterwards there's a fairly parallel increase in both groups uh, in, the, in the primary endpoint. So in this case, steroids kind of delayed things rather than, um, I think, 
you know, made a major long-term difference. And also we highlighted, or this, this study highlighted the risks of high-dose steroids uh, for IgA nephropathy. Um, we can see about 11% had a serious adverse event versus 3% in the placebo group. Although this was mostly in the full dose uh, steroids and on the reduced dose around 40 milligrams of prednisone a day to start off with, um, the, the adverse event rate was much less. So how, why was one of these studies a negative study for effects of steroids uh, and the other positive? So uh, I think it's instructive just to compare um, some of the baseline characteristics of these two groups. So in the testing group, um, the age was 36 compared to 44. So that's an eight year difference. So the testing uh, subjects were younger. A major difference in race or ethnicity uh, in the stop IGA, it was 100% white. In the testing, it was 95% either Southeast or South Asian, and Chinese subjects made up the, the, the major uh, portion of this. EGFR was roughly similar, about 60 in both groups, but proteinuria was higher in the testing group compared to uh, STOP IGA. And then when we look at the pathology in these, two in these two studies, we can see what looks like a more active form of IGA nephropathy based on more M1 lesions and E1 lesions in the testing group. And then importantly, if we look at the two placebo arms and look at the EGFR loss, as I said, the, the placebo group declined at a very slow rate. Uh, and it's possible that these were a lower risk group of patients compared to testing where the placebo group fell at roughly five mils per minute per year. So um, I'm not gonna say too much more about steroids, but um, I think steroids have to be uh, carefully selected for the high risk patients um, and certainly are not a panacea for, for probably the majority of patients we see with IgA nephropathy. And then one other point I want to make early on is, is the difference between prognosis and Im immunosuppression responsiveness. So um, there, are, there are lots of ways to try and estimate prognosis. Uh, proteinuria is, is clearly the best biomarker mark we have, but there are, there are other ways as well, which I'll, I'll talk about briefly. Um, but that's different from whether somebody will respond to immunosuppression. And so it's important to sort of differentiate those two in your mind or in our minds. So the mass c scoring, we're, we're familiar with the Oxford classification, um, M1, M0, E0, S0, T0, uh, C0. So it's actually the T score is the one that correlates best with prognosis. Um, but this is the one that, um, as you might expect, would be le least likely to respond to immunosuppression. Um, so this can sort of point us in a direction, but doesn't necessarily tell us whether somebody will respond to immunosuppression or not. And in fact, summing up the data, the KDIGO guidelines that came out in 2021 said there's insufficient evidence to support the use of the Oxford classification in determining whether immunosuppression should be commenced. So many of these factors are helpful in, pro in prognostication, uh, but KDIGO recommends we don't use this to determine whether we use immunosuppression. A more sophisticated uh, prognostic tool is the International IgA Nephropathy Prediction Tool. Um, this looks at a, a number of variables, including the MESS score, but without the, uh, without the C or the Crescent score involved. It looks at renal function at baseline, blood pressure, proteinuria at baseline, age, race, uh, use of ACE inhibitors, and immunosuppression. And this is, uh, allows us to calculate uh, the five-year risk of a 50% decline in EGFR or progression to end-stage kidney disease. And this is a this was derived from a very large data set, somewhere around 4,000 uh, subjects in Asia, Europe, North America, um, and, and gives a reasonably accurate for most people, uh, at least in, in white and Asian categories uh, of uh, uh, prognosis. Um, again, KDGO does not recommend we use this to actually decide on treatment. So it, it's helpful in discussion with the patients. I think we all probably do use it in some, in some of our discussions, uh, but it's not recommended to decide on immunosuppression by K. Deagle. Okay, so what I want to do is move on to treatment because I think this is where uh, most of the, the new material is. Um, 
from an immunosuppression point of view, obviously we'd love to have biomarkers that will actually tell us whether the disease is immunologically active or not. Um, a lot of work in this area, but we're, we're clearly not uh, at the stage uh, where we're, we're actually able to employ these at this point. So for all our IGA patients, uh, in fact, almost all our glomerular disease patients, um, we work on intensive supportive therapy. We aim to get the blood pressure lower than 120 systolic, maximize RAS inhibition, plus or minus uh, aldosterone antagonists. We prefer non-dihydropyridine calcium antagonists. We may use diuretics for volume control. We discuss lifestyle modification. And then I'm just going to cover SGLT2 inhibitors and hydroxychloroquine pretty quickly. So first of all, hydroxychloroquine, um, this is something that we, we sort of were using a couple of years ago, but uh, maybe less so now. Um, and this was really based on this actually very small study. So this is just a study, a single center study from Peking, looking at 60 patients with a six month follow up. Um, there are a couple of other non randomized studies of hydroxychloroquine as well. But they were randomized to full dose hydroxychloroquine reduced for uh, a decrease in GFR versus placebo. And what we can see is at six months, there was roughly a 50% reduction in proteinuria. Um, so I haven't seen a, a follow up for this study. I imagine we'll see one in the not too distant future. Um, but uh, we were using hydroxychloroquine uh, really for want of having anything else uh, back in kind of 2019. Uh, so then DAPA CKD came out. Um, this is a visual abstract by Ed, uh, Edgar Lerma. Um, I think we're all familiar with this study. Uh, it was a large uh, study, EGFR down to 25. Um, albumin creatinine ratios between 200 and 5,000 uh, plus or minus diabetes. So there was a subgroup that had IgA nephropathy, 270 patients. Um, and the bottom line is, as we all know, this was a positive study overall and a positive study in the IgA nephropathy group. Uh, if we look at a similar primary endpoint, except this was a 50% decline in EGFR um, over a mean follow-up of 2.1 years. The study was stopped early, as you know. Um, the primary endpoint, endpoint was reached in 4% of patients with DAPA and 15% in the placebo group. And again, if we look at the placebo group, the decline in EGFR around five mils per minute per day, and it was decreased in the in the in the DAPA group, but but decreased to minus three point five, so a difference of roughly one mil per minute per year, and then proteinuria was decreased by about twenty by about a quarter, twenty six percent. So again, if we if we compare the DAPA CKD study to uh, to the two steroid studies. Um, I think it's important to highlight that this really is a different group of patients that were studied in DAPA CKD. So the, the mean age was 51. So that's 15 years more than, than the testing trial. And if you think that most people present with IgA nephropathy, you know, often in their 20s and 30s, these patients may well have had IgA nephropathy for 20 years. And so maybe a different group than, than the testing group. Uh, EGFR was lower, so these were all these patients had impaired, or essentially all these patients had impaired kidney function, um, whereas it was better uh, maintained in the testing study. And proteinuria was less in DAPA CKD, so this is an albumin creatinine ratio, but proteinuria probably somewhere around 1.2 grams per gram or so, something like that. Uh, and we don't know about the path uh, in this. Okay. So moving on to new therapeutic options. So lots of things going on in, uh, in IgA nephropathy. So endothelin antagonists are, have been used, have been looked at in diabetic kidney disease and, uh, and were somewhat unsuccessful in that group. Um, but endothelin has lots of effects on the kidney. Endothelin one binds to the endothelin type A receptor uh, and does a number of bad things in the kidneys, causes vasoconstriction, increases glomerular pressure, activates NF-kappa B, increasing inflammation, it has direct effects on the podocytes, uh, leading to increased proteinuria, uh, might, has some effects with, on mesangial cells with mesangial cell proliferation as well. Um, it also binds to the type B receptor, um, and, and this actually counteracts some of the negative effects from the ETA receptor. And so some of the endothelin uh, antagonists will block both receptors, uh, but the one I'm gonna talk about in IgA nephropathy, sparsentan is actually a type A receptor antagonist. 
And sparsentin is an interesting medication because it's actually a combined angiotensin type 2 receptor and ETA receptor antagonist. So it acts essentially as an ARB and an endothelium antagonist at the same time. So the PROTECT study was a multicenter randomized control trial. It's a phase three with 404 patients. The, proteinuria, the primary endpoint um, for the first part of this study is proteinuria reduction at 36 weeks. So proteinuria is now more widely used as a surrogate marker for, uh, for studies of IgA nephropathy and is actually accepted by the, by the uh, FDA now. The intervention was sparsentan once a day, 400 milligrams versus erbosartan, 300 milligrams. And you can see a fairly major difference at nine months in proteinuria, 50% reduction in proteinuria in the sparsentan group, 15% uh, in the erbosartan group. Now, this paper has not been published yet, so we don't know all the details, but 50% might be kind of two grams to one gram. Uh, we, don't, we don't have all those details. Um, but this is based on this data, this medication is already under FDA review for accelerated approval on IgA nephropathy. Okay. Now, um, well, sort of the, the second half of the talk, I just want to review kind of three areas that are being targeted in IgA nephropathy based on kind of a, a more modern understanding of the pathogenesis. So as we're all aware um, that we have increased circulating um, galactose deficient IgA1 molecules, and here's one IgA and two IgA, and a second IgA molecule bound together by a, a J chain to give us polymer, polymeric IgA. So polymeric IgA seems to be formed mostly in the gut, in the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. And this is found mostly in the small bowel and ileocecal region. So B cells um, uh, obviously converted to plasma cells. Um, and an important cytokine in this is April. So April is a sort of a T cell derived uh, cytokine, uh, which binds to um, a couple of receptors, but particularly the TACI receptor, TACI on B cells, which is a B cell survival factor, but most importantly, plays an important role in class switching and plasma cell class switching to the to uh, production of IgA. So this happens uh, in predominantly in the gut. Then we have then the uh, most of this IgA is, is well should be destined to be secreted into the gut, but some uh, circulates uh, in the circulation. And in that setting, you can develop an autoimmune response to that, where you produce an IgG anti galactose deficient IgA1 antibodies, and these form immune complexes. And these immune complexes then deposit in the kidney. We have activation of complement predominantly by the alternate pathway, leading to mesangial cell injury and IgA nephropathy. So we can target this sequence in, in a number of different, uh, different sites. So the first, uh, the first site um, is using steroids, uh, in particular budesonide, which are targeted to uh, this mucosal uh, associated lymphoid tissue in the gut. And this is a study called the Nefegard study, um, the delayed release budesonide. So this budesonide is different from you know, other forms of, of budesonide uh, uh, based on where uh, it'll be actually released in the gut. So this study, a phase three study, uh, 360 patients, and what has been published so far is the part A of this study. And so similar to the Sparsentan study, the part A, which is now published uh, in KI last year, uh, describes the proteinuria reduction at nine months. So at nine months with budesonide, there was a 31% reduction in proteinuria versus 5% with placebo. The part B of this study, which is probably what we're all particularly interested in, the change in EGFR at two years is still awaited. We don't have that data yet. The intervention was budesonide, they're four milligram pills, so it's four by four uh, milligrams daily over a nine month period versus placebo. And so based on this study, um, uh, and based on this nine month surrogate output, uh, uh, endpoint uh, Tarpeo or delayed release budesonide is now FDA approved, received accelerated approval for uh, therapy in IgA nephropathy. Um, and obviously that's pending the full results of the study when we see the, the two-year data. Um, 
So here's here are the graphs from the study. Um, we can see proteinuria decreased 31% at the end of the uh, budesonide, fell a little bit further to around 50% at 12 months. Um, and we don't, as I say, we don't have the full EGFR data yet. Uh, looks as if there was a protection at 12 months, uh, but we're waiting to see the full uh, two-year data from this study. And then importantly, um, although this is a steroid, uh, it's mostly targeted to the gut. Um, there's a large first pass metabolism, so less systemic glucocorticoid exposure. Um, and it's estimated that this is the equivalent of somewhere around seven to 10 milligrams of, pre of taking oral prednisone a day. And so because of that, um, as expected, uh, the side effects were much less. Um, uh, there was evidence of infection, but very little severe infection that requiring hospitalization and only 2% uh, developed new onset diabetes during the study. Okay, so the uh, second part then is B cell therapy. So, um, so obviously uh, we have the generation of IgA, uh, galactose deficient IgA in particular, and then you have an autoantibody to this. So can we target B cells uh, to try and reduce this? There was a study looking at rituximab, our favorite, our favorite vitamin. Um, and it actually was a neg it was a small study, but it was a negative study. And so there, there hasn't been further studies in this. But the area that's that's of most interest at the moment is, is, uh, is this pathway, the importance of this cytokine April uh, binding to the TASI receptor, which plays a role, uh, as I say, in B cell survival, but importantly in immunoglobulin class switching. So there are two phase two studies which uh, are showing early, promise, uh, early promising res, uh, results, and there are some other studies undergoing as well. So this one uh, was presented at the, at the ASNs, atacicept. So atacicept is a fusion protein, so it consists of the FC domain of an, of an IgG uh, bound to the kind of binding domain of the TASI receptor. So this kind of this circulates and then binds to both uh, bliss and April inhibiting these two uh, B cell uh, cytokines or B cell promoting cytokines. So this is a phase two study, 116 patients. Um, and you can see at six months, um, there was a 36% decline in proteinuria. But I think what's most exciting about, about these studies is the reduction in the galactose deficient IgA1 molecules. So again, at six months, um, there was, depending on the dose, you can see increasing doses here, there was up to a 60% reduction in circulating galactose deficient IgA1. And then along similar lines, um, so this is from a company from Seattle. This is a, an April blocking monoclonal antibody. Um, and this is actually, uh, actually given subcutaneously now on a two weekly basis. Um, it's actually a very small study so far. Um, but in this study, again, there was roughly a 50% reduction in proteinuria at 24 weeks. Um, and again, here's looking at galactose deficient IgA1, and you can see a very fast decline so that by, uh, by four to eight weeks, there was a 60% reduction in circulating galactose deficient IgA1. So I think we're, we're looking forward to, to the phase three studies and, and seeing a little bit more about these two, these two molecules and, and other methods blocking this April TASI pathway. Okay, and then just in the last few minutes, um, obviously we're all aware there's been a lot of interest in complement over the last 10, 15 years. There's multiple companies developing uh, complement inhibitors, which are being used in a wide range of disorders, and IgA nephropathy is no different. Um, it seems that the alternate pathway is the predominant pathway in, uh, in IgA nephropathy. Um, we see properdin uh, staining when we look for it in about three quarters of patients. But there does seem to be some contribution from the lectin pathway as well. Uh, Manus binding lectin um, or C4D can be found in sort of 30 to 40 patients in studies. Um, and notably, we rarely see C1Q suggesting that the classical pathway is, is less active. So downstream, um, we uh, with C5B9 binds to mesangial cells, leading to subletic injury with cell proliferation, deposition of matrix, and the generation of a range of growth factors and cytokines and reactive oxygen species uh, leading uh, to disease. So blocking the pathway, um, obviously, is, is uh, 
is a very exciting thing in, in IGA nephropathy, a range of studies looking at blocking both the lectin pathway, there's a study like this uh, medication, Narsoplamib, and also um, a range of medications blocking either predominantly the alternate pathway um, or uh, downstream and the terminal pathway with, uh, with ravaluzumab, the longer acting ecolizumab. Um, I just want to sort of finish with, uh, uh, with this molecule. So this is the one that, that we're doing a study here on. So this is a factor B inhibitor. It's a, an oral medication, a small molecule. And factor B is critical in the alternate pathway. You can see it forms an important component of the C3 convertase of the alternate pathway, and also therefore a component of the C5 convertase. So, so works in the alternate pathway and, uh, and further downstream as well. So uh, the study that we're doing here is called APLAUSE. Um, it's looking at iptacopan, which is a factor B inhibitor. Uh, myself and Abal are both the local PIs for this. Um, this is an international multicenter study, phase three, aiming for 400 patients. The intervention uh, is iptacopan versus placebo. And the standard primary endpoints now are proteinuria at nine months and EGFR slope at 24 months. Um, so this is really a plea to consider enrolling uh, patients if you have any. Um, and the inclusion criteria are actually pretty straightforward. Um, so the EGFR has to be above 30. We're looking for patients who have persistent proteinuria greater than one gram per day. And their other therapies just have to be stable. So they can have been on uh, immunosuppression. They can be on uh, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors or hydrochloroquine, hydroxychloroquine or anything else, it just has to be stable therapy. So uh, again, if you have that, if you have patients that uh, might be eligible for this, please contact myself or Abal. And then finally, uh, just to summarize, I think this is actually a really exciting time for IgA nephropathy. Uh, it's been a long time in coming. Um, here's kind of a nice timeline of trials. Um, there were some early trials that, that, that were positive with, with immunosuppression. Um, a lot of negative studies, um, but kind of ticking along. But in the last five years, just a multitude of studies, uh, many of which are showing positivity at early stages. And also, um, now that you understand the pathogenesis better, I think uh, studies more targeted at the underlying pathogenesis of the disease. So thank you for listening. Um, I know there's lots of other things going on in IJ nephropathy I didn't have time to discuss, uh, but uh, I tried to pick out uh, the major ones. Thank you, Dr. Jefferson. Um, I'm sure there are lots of questions, so I'm going to let people ask them. I'll jump in. Uh, thank you, Ashley. Really exciting to see so many new options in this field where there were few. Um, well, this is, of course, a long-term disease that our patients will have for decades for young patients. And all these trials are, are short, really, looking at albuminuria reduction. Even DAPA-CKD was pretty short, stopped early. And uh, it was kind of concerning in the testing slides to see that there was early benefit that may not persist. So the question is, how do we think about long-term therapy um, for patients uh, that were you know, maybe starting for decades uh, when we all we have are our data on, on short term outcomes. And, and does that modify how you think about uh, what to prioritize or treat with? Yeah, and I, I think that kind of hits the nail on the head. Um, I think there's there's kind of two aspects for this. It's it's very rare that we put well, reasonably rare that we put IJ nephropathy patients into complete remission. It does happen, but maybe around 10 percent, maybe 15 percent at best. Uh, so most people, for most people, this is a chronic disease. Um, and there may be two phases to it. There may be an early, more inflammatory uh, part of the disease and, and a longer chronic part of the disease. And so I, I do think we have to think about both of those very separately. And as you point out, um, in many of these studies, um, once we start seeing longer term data, we actually see quite a lot of progression, uh, even, in the, even in the positive studies. The one that was kind of a little, which didn't really show that to the same degree was the STOP IGA study, but that probably was a lower risk group for progression um, as was shown by their rate of decline. Ashley, I have, a, I have a question. Since we even recently at the VA had discussed steroid treatment on a patient with IGA, my question to you with the data you, you showed, are there any patients who you still would say 
yes, I'm going to give them steroids? Or would you say almost all patients should not be getting steroids despite the fact there's a little bit of delay? Um, so I'm, I'm probably more in the camp of restricting steroid use in saying that Dr. Lutweiler and I started somebody on steroids yesterday for IGA nephropathy, um, but we actually use nephagan so, um, to try and limit side effects. And, and we tried to, to, to sort of limit our uh, steroid exposure to those that we consider the highest risk. So KDGO certainly still recommends steroids for the highest risk patients. The question is how you identify them. And that's really a combination of factors. Um, I do look at how active the pathology is. I do consider how high the proteinuria is. And those who are at highest risk and who look to have the most active disease, I would still use steroids. Thank you. Uh, this is a question to uh, Ashley and then also to our pathology colleagues. Uh, Ashley, as you pointed out, the MESS scoring, uh, even though M1 and E1 are more likely inflammatory and steroid responsive compared to S and T, there is data that uh, the macrophage infiltration of the glomeruli particularly CD206 and CD68 macrophages, if there is more uh, infiltration, they tend to respond better to immunosuppression. So, uh, 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 I mean, to you and then to the pathology colleagues, do we have, uh, can we stain our IG slides for the macrophages? Um, so, so I'm aware of that. We, we don't do that at this stage. Um, I know that at, uh, I remember a few weeks back at a, at a biopsy conference, you asked for staining to be done, and I can't remember what the answer was. So I'll, I'll hand that over to the pathologists. Yeah, we can certainly stain for, uh, for, for macrophages. I think uh, we, we discussed that over one of our meetings. Um, I don't think that we're, we're still there. I don't know if yeah, about uh, bring that up, and we discussed that as Bazad said as well. Um, the principle there is that they uh, count the number of macrophages in the glomeruli and then assign kind of almost like an H index, the number of macrophages in the uh, versus the number of glomeruli involved. Um, uh, given you know just the sample size that we see and some of the imprecision in the, assigning the number of macrophages with the CD68 stain, we didn't feel that it was that beneficial. Uh, also, the effect size in that study was not a lot discriminating between the high and the low scoring groups. So again, the question is what is maybe the clinical value of that stain? So it's still, I think, uh, up for debate and further discussion. But thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, I, mean, I, I would just add too that it, it's not a standardized test. I mean, this is a, a, a report uh, and the data was based on on a on a couple of studies with a couple of different groups doing it, so it's not like we can just throw a stain on it and come up with a number, and then you can use that to make clinical decisions. We would really have to, you know, develop it and, and evaluate that inside. And, and I don't know if the, um, you know, if the current data warrants uh, um, that effort, uh, especially given the fact that we already have um, an E score and other types and and presence and other types of histologic parameters. And then Dr. Lau has been patiently waiting. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Hi, Ashley. Good to see everybody. Hey, Wee Ling. Nice uh, to talk. I had a, I was wondering what your insight was with um, young patients planning for pregnancy. So I just recently met a young woman. She was actually biopsied at UW and then moved to San Diego a year and a half ago. Um, and they were kind of monitoring her proteinuria, giving her RAS inhibition. She's always had about one and a half grams per day um, proteinuria, but she really wants to move forward with pregnancy. Um, and I, I didn't know how comfortable I was with this, you know, the wait and see, um, just because pregnancy and, and maternal outcomes with the initial degree of proteinuria, the data isn't very clear. Um, so given that pregnancy and the, the rise with proteinuria in the first trimester might take, make everything kind of more difficult to, to interpret and, and manage, I, I did suggest that she should, um, go ahead and try steroids because her primary nephrologist from another institution had recommended that, um, 
just more to try and optimize everything in the next four to six months before she, you know, has to come off the ACE inhibitor and attempt pregnancy. And so I, I was wondering what the thought was from, from you. Yeah, I think that that's a very reasonable approach. Um, obviously, it's a, a long conversation uh, with uh, with the patient. Um, I think the key is to is to get her as healthy as you possibly can going into pregnancy. So at this stage, you know, making sure you maximize uh, RAS blockade, whether you use ACE inhibitors or but do everything you can until you get her ready for when she's ready to start uh, trying for pregnancy. Uh, the healthier she is going into it, then obviously the better she's likely to do. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Jefferson. Uh, we'll move on to path conference.